Okay, so this is our first video for AP World History and AP European History. Uh, and this is a quick video just to talk about the idea of what is history. This is a very complex question that philosophers and historians have been going over for a really long time. Uh, and I'm going to try to spend about half an hour trying to explain this to you. Uh, so before we talk about what it is, I think it's easier to talk about what it isn't. So what isn't history? So what isn't history? History isn't a list of names and dates. So this isn't a list of old white dudes you need to remember and a list of battles you need to memorize the dates of. That's not what this is. It's also not a list of everything that ever happened. Because that's essentially nothing. That doesn't really tell us anything. And history isn't unbiased because people with biases are telling us a story. It's not a story with good guys and bad guys. And mostly, it's also not a story with a happy ending. In fact, most of history is actually pretty depressing. If I've done my job correctly, most days you'll walk out of here feeling pretty bad. So, if that isn't history, what is history? So if you've only heard of history through these ways, so if your history classes in the past have basically just been memorize these names and dates or try to memorize everything that happened, or if somebody is trying to tell you a story from a certain perspective, that's not history. In fact, whenever I talk to people and they ask me what I do, and I say I teach history, nine times out of ten, the response is, oh, I hated history. And in my head, I don't actually say this because I try to be an actual like person and make friends and stuff, but I'll say in my head, you probably had a horrible history teacher because this stuff is not history. So what is history? History is a narrative. History is a narrative. It has lots of protagonists. Oh, protagonists. Yeah. Protagonists. It has lots of antagonists. In fact, pretty much any person in history could be the protagonist of the story or an antagonist of a story, to use these English terms your English teachers are teaching you. It's also not just a list of facts. Because facts have to be interpreted.
facts have to be interpreted. They have to mean something. And we'll look at a few facts here in a second so you can see the difference between what just a list of facts are and how historians would view those facts. So let's look at some facts. Uh, these facts aren't about world history, although they're kind of tangentially related to world history. Uh, these are American history facts and some of the most easily recognized American history facts there are, uh, especially due to that musical thing, Hamilton deal. Um, so these are very recognizable facts. Most people understand these facts as true. So I'm going to give you a list of facts. So one, uh, Great Britain's North American colonies began to uh, rebel, we'll say rebel, against the colonial tax structure and a war broke out in 1775 between the colonies and Great Britain herself. Okay, fact one. Fact two. The Americans, aided by the French, forced the main British army to surrender at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, and the British surrendered completely in 1783 and they signed a peace treaty. Three, and this will be the third fact, the last fact we talk about here, the newly independent United States wrote a new constitution in 1787 and began expanding across the continent. All stuff that you've probably heard before, stuff that you've seen in Hamilton, stuff that you were taught in like fourth grade and eighth grade American history. Now, Nobody is questioning these facts. What history does is interpret these facts to tell a story. And there are lots and lots of different stories we can tell from these facts. So we know the mythological American origin story. Right? We have the heroes of our story. We've, we put them on our money. We make Broadway musicals about them. We've got you know, George Washington. We've got Thomas Jefferson. We've got Alexander Hamilton. Right? We remember the really good things about these people. We try to forget the bad things about these people. But we've got our origin story. The idea that God liked the idea of what we were doing and blessed what the United States did and then gave the United States or gave North America to the United States and we get American history. That's the story that Americans tell. But 
that's not the only story there is. There are lots of other stories. There are lots and lots of other stories. Remember, nobody is questioning these facts. But they can be interpreted lots and lots of different ways. How about the British? The British tell a completely different story based on these facts. For the British, this was a temporary setback in their process of empire building, right? The British Empire was huge, and the North American colonies were simply one part of it. And basically, when they lost the American colonies, they turned all their attention to India and then eventually Africa. This was just a temporary setback. In fact, the British tried to get the American colonies back in the War of 1812, which is a war that the Americans don't really like to look at because the Americans kind of lost that war. But it's not just the Americans and the British. We could also look at this from the French perspective. We're not going to right now, but we could look at this from the French perspective. They're involved in the war. What about the Native Americans? They're involved. They have a story to tell. These facts mean something to them. What about the Canadians? Can can nope. Let's try that again. Canadians. The Canadians are around. What's their perspective? What about African slaves? They're involved in the story. I mean, I can keep going and list lots and lots of other different stories that are all going to look at these facts that no one is questioning and interpret them in a different way. And so suddenly, the American Revolution, which in Americans' minds is very straightforward, becomes a whole lot more complex and a whole lot more nuanced when you realize that all of these people have their own perspectives on what these facts mean. And so that's what history is. History involves the idea of looking at the facts and there are lots of different types of facts and we're going to look at lots of types of evidence that we will have to look at and tell a story based on them. That's the job of a historian looking at facts and being able to tell a story that makes sense based on these facts. Think of this like a puzzle or like a mystery to solve. We get to be whoever your favorite mystery solver is. Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Scooby Doo, who else solves mysteries? Uh, they're usually like old white ladies. Uh, we've also got like Mrs. Marple, you like Agatha Christie. We get to be all of these people that solve crimes or solve mysteries. That's what we do as historians. We look at facts and we tell a story that's based on those facts. So Right now, what I'd like to turn to is the types of things we look at as historians. So there are three types of puzzle pieces. We need to be able to play around with. 
context claims and evidence. We need to be very aware of these three types of puzzle pieces that we're going to see as we practice becoming historians. So let's look at each of these. So context. We've already kind of talked about context. Context kind of refers to the point of view of the group or the person looking at the facts. So that's this stuff. So we have to know who it is we're looking through the eyes of when we look at facts. So remember, the American context is going to be very different from the British context, or the French context, or the Native American context. OK, the next type of puzzle piece is a claim. We're going to get a lot of practice writing claims. Claims are statements supported by evidence. Statements supported by evidence. These are not claims. These are pieces of evidence. These are facts. Here is an example of a claim. And I kind of already alluded to this one earlier, but here's an idea of a claim. The Americans believed that God supported what they were doing and wanted them to keep going. And in fact, this claim has a name. It's called Manifest Destiny. That's a claim because we need evidence to back this up. We need to look at what people were saying at the time to support this. So what's an example of something that wouldn't be a claim? Uh, so this is not a claim, not a claim. I like dubstep. For one, I don't really like dubstep, but there's also no evidence to back that up. That's an opinion. This is different than a claim. Here's something else that's not a claim. Uh, people on Venus love Paul Rudd. Got nothing against Paul Rudd, but there's no evidence to support this. No evidence exists to support this. At least, not yet. We may find that Venusians really do love Paul Rudd, but we don't have any evidence of that just yet. OK, the third type of puzzle piece is evidence. Evidence is the stuff we use to back up our claims. So these are facts. These are. 
looking at sources, both primary and secondary. We might need to look at archaeological evidence. Sometimes there may be statistics, but this is evidence. This is the stuff we use to back up our claims. And the last thing I want to do before we stop this first video is to look at the types of sources we're going to look at in this class. Uh, there are three, although most of our work is going to be on the second two of these. So there are three types of evidence. The first type of evidence is archaeological. This is looking at artifacts, uh, stuff that you would dig up, uh, you know, pottery fragments, bones, things of that nature. This is used by ancient historians or people who study prehistory. And when we think about prehistory, this is before we had writing. We are not going to do a lot with this stuff. Very, very briefly, we'll look at this stuff, mostly the first week. But generally speaking, we do not really use a lot of archaeological evidence. The second type, and this is the first type that we're going to be looking at quite a bit in this class. In fact, we're going to be looking at this one probably the most in this class, are primary sources. Primary sources are written or produced by people at the time. Think of these people as like eyewitnesses. They are influenced by the time period in which they produced the source. They're influenced by the time period in which they've produced the source, meaning that we need to interpret the time period in addition to the thing that the person wrote or produced. Now, primary sources, I'm just going to stick this over here. Primary sources are written but they can also be any number of other types of things. They can be paintings, they can be sculptures, it can be a piece of architecture, uh, pretty much anything that was produced at the time. So we're gonna look at written sources a lot but we're also going to pay attention to visual sources. I'm going to say this now. We'll talk about this again later. But the person who produced the source is the person that made the painting, the sculpture, or the piece of architecture, not the person who took a picture of it. But we'll talk more about that later. The last type of source the last type of evidence are called secondary sources. Secondary sources are written by historians. Who are using primary sources. 
That's why they're called secondary sources. So historians write secondary sources and they can give us a story to interpret. Keep in mind that different historians are going to look at primary sources different ways. So, for example, a European historian is going to tell a very different story about African colonization than an African historian. And in that sense, we have to be interpreters of those different kinds of historians. They're going to tell different stories, so we have to do that job as historians. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave us on this first video. This is essentially what it is we do in a history class. Just like in a chemistry class, you're kind of learning how to be a chemist. In a history class, you are learning how to be a historian. And so you're going to try to learn the skills that historians use. And we're going to get lots and lots of practice doing that. So this is Mr. Nissen signing off. I will see you next time.